And today... We're going to be talking about the Royal Adelaide Hospital. We've been waiting a long, long time for the hospital to open its doors. We've seen a bit of a sneak peek and it's looking very, very fancy. Now, media reports are saying that it's going to open in around 10 weeks. I'm joined now by Paul Lambert, the Executive Director at the new RAH Activation, Elkie Kropf, also Director Commissioning New RAH and also Toby Gilbert, Advanced Trainee in General Medicine there at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and new RA Clinical Champion. Guys, is that opening date around about the right time? So... Uh, hi, it's Paul. Um, so hi, Paul. <laughs> what we know is that we've hit a really important milestone in the last mm -hmm. little while. We've got technical completion of the hospital, and that's great, because that means we can get in and we can start doing our commissioning work. We can do our training. We can install equipment. And we know that's going to take us about another 10 weeks. In terms of when we move, there's a few things that we need to work our way through in terms of how long will those things are really going to take, uh, what happens with winter, is that an issue, can we move um, during that winter peak that we know we have um, but we're really hopeful that we'll we'll be into the new Royal Adelaide as soon as we can hopefully by uh, you know certainly by Christmas so that, that's what we're working on at the moment. Well Paul I was going to actually ask you winter is approaching and could that be an actual problem you just touched on it then that it possibly could be what would be some of those those issues that you could face? So uh, the Minister said in the past that, you know, the, the winter um, peak can be an issue for us, remembering that in order for us to move the hospital, we will rely on all of the hospitals in the metro area as well as country as well. So it's not just a decision for one hospital. We have to be able to work across the system to make sure that there's sufficient capacity for the Royal Adelaide to ramp down for us to move, you know, as fewer patients as we can, because uh, we don't want to be moving more patients than we have to from one hospital to the other. So I guess hearing that it could be a bit longer than what the public thought you could understand some frustrations out there look i think everyone's um, trying to work as hard as they can to make sure that the hospital's safe to move into and uh, the most important thing is that we know that, that this amazing new building that we've got um, situated there on at the top of north terrace is safe to go uh, it's a big building it's a complicated building um, and we really need to make sure that all of that commissioning all of that testing all of that training of six or seven thousand staff is all completed and there's really great confidence in both the community and our staff um, to get us up the road safely is it true that there'll be australian is most expensive building and the third in the world? Uh, I have heard uh, that reported as well. Um, I'm not really an expert in, uh, in, in building costs, but uh, it, it is a big building. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic investment in South Australia and, uh, and a, a really strong investment in, in the health of the community. And the guys in here are happy to take your call. So if you've got any questions at all regarding the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, give us a call on 8223 0000. So what has been the hold-up? Uh, the hold up um, in terms of opening, opening the doors, time. yeah. So we've we've worked through uh, a number of delays with uh, with the builder, and I think they've been widely reported. And I mean, from my point of view, uh, thinking about uh, getting a hospital ready and moving a hospital from one place to the other, really, kind of what we're focused on at the moment is what we can do, and what we know with technical completion now is what we can do is to get much better access to the hospital and really start that commissioning process, uh, which is around training, around installation of equipment, uh, and really starting to get our staff down on site increasingly over the next ten weeks for their their training and orientation. The other reason, you know, being is just the sheer size of it. It's just ginormous, isn't it? And really exciting to hear about all these new technologies. Absolutely. Look, and I think the, the size is a bit deceptive. And for, for those of you who haven't seen Jane Riley's uh, virtual tour, get online and have a look at that. But that really shows really clearly that there's three massive atriums that punch down into the middle of this hospital and mm. drag in that natural light. So while it is a big footprint and it is a big hospital, um, there, there is a lot of open space as well. So there's a lot of outside inside and a lot of inside outside. And will technology wise, will we just be leading the rest of the nation in regards to what will be on offer? Uh, basically, we have probably the the best quality equipment that is on the market. Um, we certainly got f have future generation imaging equipment. We will have the biggest automated pharmacy robot system in Southeast Asia. So you can imagine for our pharmacists in South Australia, that is phenomenal in terms of the exposure and the experience they get from working in that sort of environment. Um, and I think, you know, our operating theatres are um, state-of-the-art. We've got um, 
quite sophisticated clinical digital integration. So we've got the ability to manipulate um, equipment and images within the um, operating rooms, which is um, a great enabler for teaching and training and projecting images across the facility and to other sites for um, uh, providing additional expertise to um, treating clinicians. Um, and then, of course, we have the automated guided vehicles, so the robots that will trans uh that will transport food, linen, waste, some medicines and um, some uh, consumables around the facility. So when you bring all of those things together, it is world-class, state-of-the-art and probably something that's quite unprecedented for Australia at this time. Yeah, Elkie, talk to us about these robots because when you read in a headline, oh, and robots are going to deliver food, you think, oh, wow, this is really futuristic. Can you, can you kind of explain exactly what that will look like? So the robots are really not new to warehousing industries, Woolworths, Coles, they use them in their distribution um, storerooms, have for years, yep. and the automotive industry as well. So essentially they are just low-level platforms on wheels, they are programmed um, by a computer system, um, and then they will be allocated to a trolley, for example, so they have a, their own unique identifier that is related to the unique identifier on a trolley. They'll recognise that trolley, they'll go and find it in a row of 100 trolleys, um, and that AGV or robot um, will then call its own lift. It will go to the level, um, the floor level where its um, end point is. It will dock into a docking station, and then it, when it docks into the docking station, it will send a message um, to a um, an orderly type person um, to let them know that that payload or that delivery has arrived and then that um, that orderly will collect the food for example and take it to the area where it's required so although we have the robots through the facility they're not in public areas we have it specifically elected to keep them in staff only areas and um, they are a new technology in health um, so we didn't want to find ourselves in a position where we were potentially um, transporting patients via robots because that's not something that is really that acceptable at this point in time in terms of um, what is reasonable in healthcare. So, yeah, the um, the AGVs are pretty exciting um, and certainly there's a lot of activity with those robots just at the moment through the testing and commissioning. Um, so they are running around level one of the facility. They will only ever travel horizontally through the building so you won't actually see them in the corridor network above level one. Um, but, yeah, they are a pretty exciting sort of addition to, you know, what is already a pretty... Um, technology high and exciting facility. If you've got a question about the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, now is the time to ask your question. I've got three executives from the new RA and they are here and happy to take your calls. 8223 0000. Let's have a chat with Faye. Hi Faye. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. I've got to be quick about this, but I've got four questions um, to ask. Uh, first of all, question one, transferring patients from one hospital to the other, whose responsibility is it for payments for transferring them from one to another? The second is co-payment for the non-urgent cases. If so, how much? Will there be a co-payment? This is for the new RA. Um, Faye, we might just stop you there. We'll get them to answer those two first. Yep. So, Paul, yeah. Well, I've got two others. Yeah, that's fine. We'll come back to you. So, sure. Faye, Faye, all of the transport costs um, for the new Royal Adelaide move uh, are all, will all be covered as part of um, the move process. We're working really closely with SA Ambulance um, to make sure that anybody who's uh, uh, an inpatient at the time of that move is um, uh, is safely moved from one hospital to the other. So you don't need to worry about um, co-payments in, 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 if you were an inpatient at the time and moved up the road. No. Um... So, now, co-payment, what's happening about those? No, there will be no, no co-payments for any moves um, between the two hospitals. So, yeah, that, that's, all, that's all fine. That's all covered as part of our move plan. But the other two is um, um, 
sorry, I can't read my own writing. Vi- uh, victims of stroke and heart attack, will they be given the top priority over others that is not so urgent? And the other thing is the eye clinic. Will there be an eye clinic there? there? Because I don't think anybody could bypass the Royal Adelaide Hospital for the good that they do, and if so, if not, where? Great, Faye. So Toby Gilbert will answer your question there. He's the advanced trainee in general medicine at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and the new RA clinical champion. So you can help Faye with that one, Toby. Hi, Faye. Thanks for uh, for phoning in. I think it's uh, I think you raised some good questions there. I think that um, the stroke care, especially in the Royal Adelaide, has recently undergone a massive improvement so that we now have uh, 24-7 cover for, for stroke. And so I think um, whether it's... Uh, Monday to Friday or whether it's a weekend, whether it's two o'clock in the morning, um, the stroke care that's going to be received at the New Royal Adelaide will be uh, absolutely top drawer. And you're right, we, we will we treat people as ever with the most urgent cases first. And so if you come to us with a, with a serious heart problem, um, of course, that you will come to the top of the list. Thanks, Faye. And I've got an email here from Marianne. When will EPAS be ready? So EPAS is, is ready. Um, we, we have a, um, a hospital site within Central Adelaide Network, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, currently uh, running full EPAS. So EPAS is ready. Um, we've made a decision at the new Royal Adelaide to roll out a, a limited functionality in, initially um, to help our both clinical and administrative staff deal with the number of changes that they're dealing with um, in, this, in this large move. Um, but EPAS is ready uh, and is functioning uh, effectively uh, um, uh, across, the, across the system. All right, let's have a chat with Lee. He's called in from Glenelg. Hi, Lee. Hi. I've just got a quick question. From what I'm led to believe, the car park is going to be... Um, a dreadful for patients to try to get in and for visitors and um, you know that there is a possibility that we'll be using trams. Can you um, give me your comments on that? Yes, surely. Um, thanks for calling in. Um, the the uh, car parking at the new hospital is all underneath um, uh, the new hospital. Um, one of the great advantages, I guess, at the new hospital is that you will be able to drive your car right up um, very close to the lift well, which will take you directly into the place where you need to be. We can't currently do that within the, the current Royal Adelaide. Uh, and so if you are driving, um, then that will be an option. Uh, there's um, uh, taxi ranks out the front of the new hospital um, for very rapid um, drop-off. Off, um, as well as in a drop-off and pick-up area uh, around the emergency department. So uh, we're quietly confident that the car parking arrangements that we've put in place are superior to what we have currently got um, and will get people to where they need to be as soon as they can. Cheers, Lee. We're going to take a really quick break, but stay with us because we're going to talk about the logistical preparations that are going to be needed to move everyone from one hospital to the other, what it means for you, your hospital records... And please give us a buzz, 8223 0000, if you've got any questions at all to ask the three executives here from the new Royal Adelaide Hospital. They're more than happy to take your calls. Rob Good afternoon, it's nine minutes to two o'clock and you're chatting with Jade Robran and it is our state at the moment. That is our topic of conversation and today we're featuring the new Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'm joined here by three executives of the new RA, Paul Lambert, Elke Crump and also Toby Gilbert. Now, I've come across on social media a couple of rumours that their new hospital's being built without a morgue. Well... That's not true, Jade. We definitely have a, a morgue and it's on level one of the facility. It's a, a morgue that will accommodate um, 40 bodies supporting the State Forensic Science Centre, which um, is often at capacity. Um, so we certainly do have a morgue. I'm guessing, Elka, that'd be a very tough thing to forget Indeed. in the building process. Yes. <laughs> and it sticks out in my mind because that was the first group of um, design meetings we had, so I can definitely vouch for a morgue being there. Now, what logistical preparations need to be made to move patients to the new hospital? So logistics, I guess, happen across multiple levels. Um, we working very closely with external agencies, the, the council, to make sure that there's no major events on any move day, working with Department of Transport around lights and, um, you know, light sequencing and roadworks to understand the impact there. Um, we're also then... Uh, 
we are undertaking a large amount of review of our own patients to work out um, if we could um, reduce the number of patients, um, how sick would they be and, and how would we need to move. We, we've got a, a great um, partner in um, the removal company that help us with the physical uh, removal process, actually lifting and shifting things. Mm -hmm. and that's a massive logistics process which we're working with some professionals um, to help us to do, as you, as you would imagine. And then clearly um, our, our, our partnership with the SA Ambulance Service uh, and MedStar um, who's really whose core business and whose day job is moving unwell patients around the state um, and whether that's um, via uh, ambulance uh, or whether it's uh, in the case of MedStar who, who use um, aircraft um, all of those expertise will be brought into bear uh, to help us make sure that we move people safely so really big logistics issue but uh, a lot of coordination uh, and a lot of expert support to help us get up the road. So how many beds are in the old building now? Um, this is an interesting conversation about when's a better bed. Uh, we have a, a mixture of overnight beds. Uh, we have same-day beds. Uh, we have a number of uh, ambulatory areas and, and chairs where people come in for um, for uh, chemotherapy mm -hmm. and other issues. Um, we're moving to a hospital which um, has greater capacity. Uh, so we have uh, over um, 700 overnight beds and 100 um, day beds in the new hospital, plus then uh, day treatment areas in renal uh, and in cancer, as well as in medical directorates. So it's a, so it's a whole, a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, um, ways of managing people most effectively. I've got an SMS here from Dennis. Will the chest clinic move? So we're, we're working through a number of the, um, the smaller services um, uh, and uh, allied services that sit alongside and are a very important part of some of our specialist services like the chest clinic. The plan at the moment is for the chest clinic to move mm -hmm. uh, and for that activity, both um, clinical trials and clinical activity, to move up to the new hospital. Now, interesting question here. How will you make sure that patients' medical records will be moved to the new hospital safely and without compromising their confidentiality? So patient records, um, uh, one of the decisions that we have made, uh, as I said previously, was to go with a limited um, rollout of EPAS uh, to allow us to um, deal with um, the huge numbers of changes that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, from a medical records point of view, we have a, a medical records uh, store um, for recent records on site at the old Royal Adelaide Hospital, um, but the vast majority of our medical records in terms of the, the historical records are kept off site already. So we'll, we'll continue to, um, to work with our medical records partners um, and ensure that there's, there's a really ironclad and safe process to make sure that our clinical staff get the records that they need when the patient's there. Now, what's going to happen over the next couple of months to, in terms of testing equipment and processes to make sure that there's no faults in the system, no cobwebs? So at the moment we're at uh, day 12 of, 12 of technical completion. So the facility transition period, as the period is called, is a 90 consecutive day minimum period, um, during which time we will be bringing um, consumables into the facility, so stocking all of the, the inpatient areas or in the emergency, the intensive care with all of the um, medical consumables that are required to provide care. And we are undertaking a comprehensive uh, training um, schedule to ensure that our staff are uh, as prepared as they can be for when we start to receive patients. Um, and then there is all of the mobile equipment. So we are loading the hospital in now with 5,000 infusion pumps to provide um, medications. We're stocking uh, the distribution cabinets for medication. So everything that is required to be able to provide safe care for day one is really what happens at this period of time, during this period of time. Now, when you were looking at designing, you know, what main design aspects that, you know, have you taken into consideration when thinking about, you know, services, patients, staff and the hospital? It's just been a gigantic effort. Mm. It has been um, quite a big effort. And I guess one of the fundamental principles in um, hospital care is managing infection. So I guess our biggest win or asset in the new RA, or one of our biggest wins or assets are the single rooms. So every patient will have their own bedroom and their own, own, their own en suite. And I think that's really will go a significant way to assist, assisting us 
as clinicians um, to manage cross-infection between patients. Um, obviously, staff need to wash their hands every time they, they touch a patient or leave a patient, and I think the bedrooms won't solve the problem, but they are certainly a better enabler to manage infections within the facility. We've also got um, tremendous access to natural light. We've got um, over 70 green spaces or mm. garden areas that staff and patients and the public will have access to. So as much as we've tried to make a, a fabulous hospital for patients, we've tried to make it a really great facility for the public and for, for staff as well. So, um, you know, the assets are endless really in terms of what that facility can provide and will provide over you know the next 70 to 100 years. The open spaces and atriums and gardens that you just touched on is that a real well-being thing that you've focused on and is there evidence to show that you know having things like that around you when you're going through a bit of a dark time in hospital can help speed up recovery and lift moods? Uh, it certainly is and it's a learning very much from the Scandinavian countries that have very little light in winter. Um, they actually have it now legislated that every area, every work area or every patient area needs to have access to outdoor spaces. But I guess in terms of the New Royal Adelaide, we have specifically designed spaces, for example, in our spinal unit. They have their own dedicated garden where we can take out a patient that is um, still quite unstable, perhaps on life support, and actually allow them to get the sen have the sensation of the sun on their on their skin or the the wind um, or the breeze sort of uh, passing their face. So you know those things when you're in hospital long term are little things that we all take for granted, but that are really craved for by people that have that right taken away or that that ability taken away so um the gardens generally are accessible by staff or patients and um, there are clearly some gardens that are um, more for staff and they're associated with discrete staff only um, facilities but generally i think people or the community will be amazed at the level of garden amenity and functionality within the new ra I was funny, I was telling you during the ad break that my brother broke his neck in November and spent some time at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and we eventually were able to take him out, I think, week two and just to feel the sun on his mm. face and just get a bit of vitamin D. He went from that grey, awful colour to, to having some colour in his cheeks and yeah. it changed his attitude. Mm. So I think it is, it's is—it's really important. It's not just aesthetics to make yes, the hospital right. look pretty, but it actually does do it's a hell of a lot for patients. It's got a very patients. practical application yeah. and I think, you know, the, the design is very much focused around all of the patient care areas being on the periphery of the building or of a wing so um, then the, fo the priority is really for light into areas where people spend a lot of time patients for example and then the st staff areas where people are much more transient mm -hmm. they they get some um, filtered light or spill light but really the focus is on you know the views and the access to natural light very much for the patient because they're the ones that obviously spend um, the most time in sort of a, a stationary location. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time and taking the calls. We really appreciate it and can't wait for an opening date. It sounds very exciting and I can't wait to get through it and have a look as well. Jane tells me it's quite spectacular. Indeed it is. <laughs> thank you very much.